Now, the Lalaurie Mansion is the crown jewel of all haunted houses in the city. New Orleans is the most haunted city in America, and that is the most haunted structure in the entire parish. So welcome to the companion video to Aaron Ducker vs the Monsters Ghosts Edition. So this is the legend of the Lalaurie Mansion. In 1834, the Royal Street home belonged to Madame Delphine McCarty Lalaurie. A sophisticated society belle, Madame Lalaurie was known throughout the city for her lavish entertainments and grand balls. <laughs> she had balls. They were throwing five or six grand, elegant, luxurious balls every week. Madame Lalaurie was married to a physician, Dr. Leonard Louis Nicholas Lalaurie, also a highly respected member of the community. Together, they lived the luxurious lifestyle of southern aristocrats. But the public demeanor of this couple was a hideous charade. Lurking behind the charming smiles were the souls of sadists, a fact that came to light on April 10th, 1834. To sort of sum up the events that took place on April 10th, 1834, uh, Madame Delphine Lalaurie is being attended to by a servant girl, uh, I believe her name was Leah, brushing her hair. The poor girl hit a snag, which enraged Delphine. She retrieves a riding crop, I believe it was, a whip of some sort, possibly from beneath her vanity, and starts to attack the girl. Poor thing fled away. She chased after the girl. Leah, Leah ran. She was terrified about the punishment that was about to be dealt upon her. So terrified that the girl, a young girl, ran to the third floor of the building and flung herself from the third floor balcony, her skull smashing on the street below. A fire broke out in the kitchen of the mansion and quickly spread throughout the structure. Main story concerned a room. A room on the third floor of the mansion. A room that, when they upset the Lowry, slaves were taken. Many would go in. None would come out. The authorities found this room. They had to break down the door to get inside. What they found the firemen smelled the unmistakable odor of death and witnessed a sight sickening beyond belief. The fire marshal lights two lanterns, hands the first one to the police chief, who takes out a pistol, walks in, goes to the right. The fire marshal with his own lantern and a club walks in and goes to the left. Though he enters second, he cries out first because he bumps into something. One of two operating tables, upon which a man and a woman have been chained and they are still alive. Brings the lantern closer and finds that he's mistaken. Well, yes, they are still alive. No, they're no longer a man and a woman. They are the victims of a crude sex change operation. Several slaves were found in various stages of torture. I understand one gentleman had his mouth sewn shut uh, when they cut through the stitching, found his mouth stuffed with feces. The New Orleans Bee newspaper described what the firemen witnessed in its April 11th, 1834 edition. Upon entering, the most appalling spectacle met their eyes. Seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, were seen suspended by the neck, with their limbs apparently stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. Language is powerless and inadequate to give a proper conception of the horror which a scene like this must have inspired. We shall not attempt it, but leave it to the reader's imagination to picture what it was. There were several slaves in the room, or at least what was left of them. They had been tortured, mutilated, abused, some of their limbs stretched. According to legend, the Lowleries had been conducting strange experiments on slaves. According to one legend, uh, one young girl had her bones broken and reset by Dr. Lowlery in such a way that her walking resembled that of a crab. Amputations, skin grafting, uh, just really bizarre kinds of medical experiments. One story concerned a man and 
Uh, the claim was that he had a hole in the side of his head and skull, and it had been filled with, with maggots. His face has been sliced down the middle and across the center from ear to ear underneath his nose. Each quadrant of his face has been meticulously peeled back and pinned to a corresponding portion of his skull. And it appears that there are violent muscle contractions going on underneath where his face used to be. When they bring that lantern closer, they find that those are not muscles contracting. Those are maggots feeding. Maggots intentionally introduced by Dr. Louis in a sadistic experiment to see how long human life can be sustained with the vermin eating the infection that grows there. Word of the atrocities quickly spread. The savagery of Madame LaLaurie and her physician husband was simply too much for the community to bear. The people of New Orleans called for the LaLaurie's heads, but they didn't get them. Madame Delphine and her husband fled the city. They escaped to Paris. Most scholars agree that the likely outcome of their story is that they arrived safely in Paris under assumed names. With all of that money, no one asked any questions. One fact that's often overlooked is the fact that Madame LaLaurie's father was killed in a slave uprising. I've always thought the reason she did these unspeakable acts was because in her twisted mind, this was revenge for her father's death. You have to understand, this poor girl witnessed her father getting decapitated by a slave during a slave riot in Santo Domingo. This scarred her mentally from a very young age and she never got over it, hence I believe she was taking advantage of her, her wealth and her previous husband's wealth and buying these people and venting her frustration on them in such a horrendous manner. I, I, I always chalk it up to the worst case scenario of xenophobia that I've ever heard of. Fear of other cultures. Ever since that day, there's been some spooky goings on. In the late 19th century, a sleeping servant found himself literally being strangled by the ghost of Madame LaLaurie. He awoke to see what appeared to be a sort of translucent white female with black hair, very pale features, very attractive, but with a very maniacal look on her face, choking him. Um, he's preserved by a pair of black hands who break her grip from around his throat. And the specter then screams and disappears. So this is um, evidently she and her slaves are still having at each other. There is a woman who uh, does make a report to a local paper. She claims she is uh, heading towards her children's rooms, I believe, found a woman holding which she believed was her own child, I understand, and then hurls this infant down the stairs. As it turns out, it wasn't hers. It was evidently the spirit of someone else's child. We don't know who, I don't know who. And there was a, a very similar incident shortly after that. She also made the, this report about going into the room, found a woman hovering over the crib, rushes towards the crib to protect her child. The woman disappears right before her and then realizes her baby has a sock stuffed in her mouth. She quickly removes it. The baby was fine. April 12th, people walking by on that same side of the street heard screams, unearthly groans from inside. And they were so convinced that whatever may be generating it must be demonic in nature, they called the likeliest person, the Roman Catholic priest. They said, you've got to go inside and exercise this building. The priest's response was, hell no. So he then hires six Protestant American soldiers, and they go in with them on April 16th. They go inside, and they're in for about 15 minutes, because they heard, quote, otherworldly languages of the dead being spoken by angry spirits, unquote. 1953, city council apparently uh, even considered buying the building. But then another developer came in and said, well, we're going to do it, and we're going to convert it into apartments and get people from out of town to live in them. Brilliant! And so that's precisely what they did. But of course, renovations require, among other things, putting down new floorboards. So they go in in the summer of 1953, and they're about ready to put down modern plumbing. But first, they rip up the old floorboards, and they find underneath a lot more than old plumbing. They find eight human skeletons, full, signs of great distress, underneath the floorboards, especially when you consider the horror that the underside of the floorboards had scratch marks. 
eight people had been buried alive inside that mansion. And now we know more about the legends that started about this place being haunted back in the 1830s. People hearing screams from the other side of the street. Those weren't ghosts. Those were real people underneath the floorboards begging for help. And they did not speak French or Spanish or English, but rather an obscure dialect of Senegambian. These were illegally smuggled West African slaves. They were crying out for help in the only way they knew how, which was of course then misinterpreted as otherworldly languages of the dead being spoken by angry spirits. No more singing, no more laughing, no more sunny days. She left and took the colors with her, buried in her 